Hi guys, today I'm going to take a look at LLMs or large language models like ChatGPT and BARD. Now, my interest in these, of course, coincides with the explosion of these onto the scene over the last year or so. With something like ChatGPT, you are able to get very nuanced and contextually driven responses to questions, and it gives you some pretty good information. Now, of course, it's not always accurate information, so you kind of have to make sure you check whatever it's giving you. But at the same time, its ability to kind of extract from a question what your intent is and then be able to display an answer that is very nuanced in its approach and its details is something that seems like magic. But if you can pull the covers back on that just a little bit and look at the why and the what question about what makes an LLM work, then it really kind of takes away a little bit of the magic behind it because the concept is really pretty simple on the surface. Now, of course, the technical details to make all that work are astronomically more complex than the actual idea itself. And I'm not going to be able to get into all of that because I don't even want to pretend I understand it all. But I think at the surface, if you understand where these are coming from, then the technical details will kind of shake out from there. And it, and it makes it a, at least understandable from a technological perspective. And that's really where I'm at in my journey on trying to understand these. Now, with all of that, I also want to be able to play with these as well. And to do that, you can actually run an LLM on your local desktop. Of course, it's not going to be nearly as sophisticated as ChatGPT or Bard, but you can still download one and use it in your local computer. It doesn't even have to be a really powerful computer to actually make these work. So I'm going to show you how to do that too, just so that you can kind of get an experience of where these things kind of came from. Let's just go and look at the what and the why, and then we'll just show you how you can run these in a local context and then compare that to something like ChatGPT, just so you can see kind of how the inputs and outputs vary depending on what model you're using, depending on the sophistication of the model. So if you were to ask me what an LLM is, Fundamentally, I would tell you that an LLM is just a very sophisticated autocomplete. Now, autocomplete is something that people are very familiar with. That's where you're typing a word or a sentence on your phone and the algorithm that's built into the keyboard will attempt to predict what the next word in your sentence or phrase will be. So you can just tap on that word and it will accelerate your text input into your phone. Now, an LLM is trying to do something very similar to that, except it's trying to do it at a much grander scale. It might be trying to finish a sentence by projecting what the next word will be, but it's also trying to project not only what the next word would be, but maybe what the entire sentence is trying to say, or maybe it's trying to under predict the answer to a question that you're asking. And so it's able to use very minimal input to extrapolate from that minimal input an entire block of text that has nuanced content that's very contextually relevant to what it is that you're trying to do with the large language model. And to get that more nuance and that complexity and all of the sophistication, it uses lots and lots of data to generate those nuanced responses. It's basically analyzing all these different data inputs that are gathered from the internet. And it's basically parsing those down and using statistical analysis to use that as a basis to predict what you would answer if you were to ask a certain question or to input in certain words. So this example right here that I have on the screen, why do apples could be an input into an LLM? And that input right there would have a completion of many different possibilities. And you could say, why do apples fall from trees? You could ask, why do apples turn brown when cut? Or why do apples float in water? All of those would be legitimate responses to just three words. And an LLM would be able to predict that based on just those three words. Now, I doubt an autocomplete could do that, but an LLM certainly could. And there's certainly other possibilities that are within the scope of what you could do with something as simple as three words put into an LLM. Now, an LLM gets even better the more input you give it. So that gives it a lot more content context, which leads us to the next differentiator between a, just a generic autocomplete and what LLMs are actually capable of. 
Now, beyond just being able to predict what's next in a sentence or what is the answer to a question, that prediction is also usually going to be very contextually relevant with an LLM as well. So imagine I have the phrase, I have a bug. Now, if I was to say this, there's a lot of ways that I could answer the following question, can you help? This doesn't alone give me a lot of context, but it does give me some hint about what the context might be with keywords like bug. And a bug could be any number of things depending on the context I'm talking about. So with this context, I could follow that up with a question. I might ask, are you sick? And in this case, I'm thinking of a bug in terms of something like the flu or maybe a cold. I got a bug, I don't feel that good today. Or it could be something that's more literal. Do you, do you need an exterminator? And this might be a bug that's crawling around your house or something like that. And you need to get rid of the bug or maybe multiple bugs, depending on what you're talking about in this case. And another context you could have is you heard something that means somebody put a bug in your ear. You heard some kind of rumor or factoid and uh, you want to find out maybe information about that or something like that. And that might be the context of bug. Or it could be something with code. Is your code broken? And in this case, it's going to look for a computer bug that is a flaw in a computer program that you need to fix. And maybe the LLM will attempt to help you fix that problem. So all of these are different ways that we can think about context of a single word. And what an LLM is going to be able to do is based on more input or maybe some more context, be able to contextually answer the question whenever you have the context that's settled. So it's trying to not only predict what the response would be, but it also make the context aware in the response and also have a lot of nuance to that context as well. So the combination of the ability to predict next words or entire phrases or entire paragraphs within a given context is really what makes an LLM such a powerful tool. So here is a sample of things that you can do with an LLM. Now, I'm not gonna go into each one of these. I, I will do a separate video that will go through this list and talk about how these can be used in just your daily productivity. But this is only a sampling of the kinds of things that LLMs are capable of doing. And there's certainly gonna be new discoveries as these things mature. So I wanna talk about these three terms in the context of the LLMs. I'm gonna start with batch sizes. We'll get to these other two in just a second. But the batch size represents the data set that is actually used to build a large language model. So all of this starts with some kind of text data with a, with a large language model. You have a data set that is just pure text data and it could be all different kinds of text data. It could be songs and poems, it could be encyclopedia articles, it can be entire novels, it can be plays, it could be anything that uses text data. And that data set is going to be gigabytes upon gigabytes in size. And so it has a lot of different contexts embedded in that text data. So whenever we start to build a LLM, we'll take that data set and we'll divide it into two parts. We'll have training data and testing data. Now, the training data is then fed into a training algorithm, which then attempts to produce a candidate model. And the candidate model is one that it should represent something that can produce some kind of results. It should be able to provide some kind of prediction, but it might not be the most accurate prediction. So to test it, what is done is a validation procedure with the testing data. The testing data is then fed into the validation algorithm in much the same way that your inputs would be uh, put into the LLM whenever you're interacting with it in a production context. And it's tokenized. So that is basically the text data being broken down into itty bitty parts such as words or even characters and then being passed into the validation algorithm and it's basically treating it the same way it treats your prompts. And the outputs from the validation are either going to be marked as successful or failures based on the testing data because all this testing data is already prepared with expected outcomes. And if the output from the validation is nothing like 
what's expected, then it will mark it as a failure. But if it marks it as a success, then that we know that part of the model is good. So parts that are marked as failures and parts that are, that are marked as successes are then fed back into the training algorithm. And it goes through this entire process with another iteration with the hopes of building an even better candidate model. And it will repeat this process over a period of time, either for a given time box or until we're satisfied with a given model till finally we get some kind of output model. And then that output model is the one that we have in terms of our production oriented environments that we can interact with as humans at the keyboard. So the part of this validation process that is marking things as successes and failures is where parameters comes in. And the parameters are used to tweak the inputs and outputs that are coming into what we call a neural network. And that's gonna look something like what I'm about to show you on the next slide. So this represents a neural network and this is ultimately what a model is. It's a neural network that has all of these different nodes and these are called layers by virtue that we have this input layer, then we have these hidden layers, then we have this output layer. Now, these input layers represent the input that comes into the model. And that of course would be the, the training data, the test data, and then ultimately the prompts that you're putting into the, the model. And then you have these hidden layers and these hidden layers represent statistical calculations that are performed on the data. Now, uh, a neural network doesn't understand text data. So all that text data is converted into numerical data and it's gonna perform some kind of statistical analysis at each one of these hidden layers until it gets to an output layer. And then the output layer will then have something that is statistically relevant. Now, as part of the training, we're expecting some kind of output. And so we're looking for something that is statistically relevant in the output layer that is pretty much baked into the, the testing data. And so that's attempting to look for something that is already known. And so that will allow us to flag something as either a success or a failure based on what we put into the model. And where it fails, it's gonna flag it. Where it succeeds, it's gonna flag it. And that's where it's going to adjust the parameters. And so what the parameters are, are basically values that are used to tweak the inputs and outputs from each one of these layers right here. And so it will change the value ever so slightly to have a different input or a different output. And then that will impact everything downstream of the particular layer that we're adjusting for. And that is what parameters do inside of the model. And with each adjustment of those parameters, we are hoping that we get something that's going to be more in line with our expected outcomes in our training. And the closer we get to those expected outcomes, the more accurate the model becomes and the more accurate the predictions it makes become. So you can see how parameters impact the accuracy of a model. So if you want to have a model that has a lot of different contexts and within those contexts has a high degree of nuance, you need to have a model that has tons and tons of parameters associated with it. And that's what this particular chart is representing. It's showing models by their parameters. So the parameters themselves um, are represented on this y-axis and the models are across the bottom down here. So the first models that we saw were like GPT-1 and GPT-NEO and GPT-2. These came out around 2017, 2018, and these would have millions of parameters in them. But over time, the number of parameters has grown exponentially as we've gotten to things like GPT-4. We started with billions of parameters right here, and then we're talking tens of billions around here, and then we finally break into like the hundreds of billions with like uh, GPT-3, and then uh, we're talking about trillions of parameters with like GPT-4. And so there's been an exponential increase in the number of parameters over time. And this allows us to have a model like GPT-4 that has tons and tons of different contexts, and, and then it has a ton of nuance within those contexts because it just has orders of magnitude more parameters than some of these earlier models like GPT-1. Now the trade-off with having a ton of parameters is that you need a ton of compute to not only train the model, but also to run the model. And so 
to run GPT-4, uh, OpenAI has to have a data center worth of servers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a day just to operate the model. It's not even talking about the number of machines needed to train that model. To even train something like GPT-1 or GPT-2, you could do that on a commodity computer, but it would take days, maybe even weeks to accomplish just for something that has a few billion parameters in it. Now you can run some of these models on a commodity computer in your, your home. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute, but beyond uh, some of these models, like right here to run some of these models down here, there's just really no practical way that you can run these in your home. You really need data size, data center size, compute clusters to operate these models. And that's why you need APIs to interact with these models. But I'm going to show you how you can run some of these right here, just so you can get familiar with some of these more early iterations of models and how they work. And so you can have a better appreciation for some of these later models on this end of the spectrum, like GPT-4 or GPT-3 or 3.5. So if you want to play with these locally, you can install this application called GPT-4All. And this is the GitHub repo. It's open source, so you can download and compile the code if you so choose. But it also uh, is installable uh, with pre-built binaries. So you can come over here to releases and download the latest builds under assets right here. You can get GPT uh, for all for Linux, Windows, or Mac. If you want to get the more production oriented, you know, context, you can uh, go to their website, GPT for all.io, and you can download this for Windows, Mac, or Linux. And you can see this is some screenshots and it will allow you to interact with these particular models. Now, the other cool thing that this app does, and it's more of an advanced feature, is it enables you to kind of productize a model if you want to, and you have the ability to call APIs that are built into this app as well to interact with the model using your own code. But the UI allows you to play with them, and that's what I'm going to show you here. So once you've downloaded and installed uh, the particular package for your platform, and it's got instructions on how to do that, you can get one of these models through the UI. And so here's a, a list of the models that it supports. And of course, each one of these models are going to have a different number of parameters. They were trained on different data. And so they're going to have varying degrees of success depending on what you're trying to do with it. Now, of course, I haven't played with all of these and exhaustively tried to produce results by testing these apples to apples. So I really can't tell you which one of these is so-called best or worst. And really it's not a matter of best or worst. It's which one of these is going to work best for the application that you're going to use it for. And so that's really what you're looking for. But if you want to just go by pure numbers, this one looks like it's doing pretty well right now, this Noah's Puffins model. And you can see that all these different benchmarks uh, indicate that it's got some fair, uh, fairly high uh, scores for these different things that it's looking for. But in any case, to use this application, install it, and then you can launch it on your local desktop, which I'm going to do right now. And uh, this particular application is going to pop open this dialogue right here that will ask you to download a model once you open it up for the first time. And so it's going to recommend a few different models. And you can even use ChatGPT for and ChatGPT 3.5 if you have an API. It's not going to download that model, of course, but it'll interact with those APIs if you want to test uh, certain features with this application against those models. But if you want to run these locally, uh, you can uh, just download one. So you have these available right here that's recommending, but then it also has um, a number of other models right here. And then you have a download path that you can set. I'm going to download this one, and it will take a minute to download depending on your context. And it will show you uh, some stats about it. So this one has uh, a size of about 6.8 gigabytes. Um, it, has, it requires about 16 gigs of RAM. So you need at least some RAM in your machine and it has 13 billion parameters. So I'm gonna let this download and then I'll come back when it's finished and we'll just interact with it to see how it works. So the, the text on this app is a little bit hard to read. I already closed the window that allowed me to install models, but uh, this one allows you to uh, basically interact with it by typing something down here. But before you do that, I would recommend setting this to use your GPU if you have one on your machine, if it's supported. So you can run it on the CPU, which will work fine for a lot of use cases. But uh, if you want to make things run faster, run them on your your uh, GPU because it's able to run models much more quickly using your GPU. So I'm going to use my RTX 3060 on this particular box here. And so with that, 
you can then start interacting with them, the actual model that you downloaded. So if you have more than one, you can uh, choose it from this drop down up here, but I just have the one installed that I, I installed when I launched it a few seconds ago. And then I can type in a prompt in and say, tell me about the Berlin wall. And this will probably generate some kind of context about the Berlin wall. And it's probably gonna give me things about the date and, and uh, the actual political climate of what was going on and probably provide a description of the actual wall itself. And so this is uh, right now describing it. I know it's probably hard to read this text on a YouTube video, but it's telling me that it was established uh, barrier constructed in Germany in 1961. It was basically there to prevent citizens from uh, going from West Berlin into East Berlin and vice versa. And, uh, and it's talking about the dichotomy between um, communism and uh, then West Berlin, which was controlled by the Allies. And then uh, it was done in 1961, but came down in 1989. And then it talks about the political climate, climate at the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany in 1990. And then um, and it says that while the, there's parts of the wall that, demand, that remain, it, it, most of the sections are in the East German side. And um, it's mostly uh, gone, but there's still parts of it that are still intact that are just kind of a, a memorial for it. And so that's what it's talking about here. It's just providing me context for that particular question. It was able to generate that based off of a very brief, uh, even misspelled um, context that I gave it. I said, tell me about with an R in the end, the, the Berlin Wall. Another cool thing that you can do with these kinds of things is obviously correct sentences and grammar. So if I just type in some sentence, I'm going to say, um, can you Please correct this sentence. And then I'm going to give it some quotes. This is a sentence that I am typing and I have no idea if I am getting anything right. And I'm going to close it up and just like see if it will correct this uh, for grammar and things like that That uh, based on that sentence. Here's the, cor uh, the corrected version of the sentence. This is a sentence that I'm typing and I have no idea if I'm getting anything right. And so it fixed some commas and capitalization issues and uh, things like that and even fix a spelling error that uh, I had in that sentence as well. So again, something else you can do with these large language models. And these are things that you could do with GPT as well. But you can see that even with this smaller model that's around 16 billion uh, parameters, uh, orders of magnitude smaller than what you would get with GPT, it's able to do some you know, things that GPT, uh, ChatGPT 4 and 3.5 are able to do at the same time. So something to play with. And this has some advanced features that I'm not going to get into, but you can also use this with your own documents if you wanted to. You could could um, have a re document repository of things like Word documents or uh, HTML documents or just text documents, and you can put those into a folder and it will build a database of those. And then you, it will uh, incorporate that into its data set enabled, and that will enable you to ask questions about the data that's contained in those documents. And it also has the ability to write apps against this particular app as well that it has an API. And I might show you how to use some of these more advanced features in a future video. But for now, let's just look at how to play with these. And so you can get used to how these work and you can download the different models and see how they uh, function and how a more advanced model with more parameters might compare to something that's simpler. So something to look at as well. So I hope this has been informative for you to show you how to get exposure to large language models and generative AI. And hopefully it's kind of demystified it in some way so that you can have a little bit better understanding of how they actually work under the covers and then uh, show you how uh, they can be applied in some context. And so I'm going to be doing uh, future videos in this particular vein. I'm going to look at how um, you can use GPT just as part of your daily uh, productivity and your job. And then I'm going to show you how you can use uh, GPT and incorporate that using Azure's OpenAI. And then maybe a follow-up video that goes into some of the details of this particular context right here using this local context for building apps against this app as well. So look forward to that content. And of course, like and subscribe to the video and also share it with your friends and ask me questions in the comment section down below. I'll be glad to answer anything I can. I'm certainly not the guru of gurus on this, but I am certainly interested in um, helping other folks understand this really cool and emerging technology. 
If you like this content, please consider subscribing to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You can also like this content by clicking on the thumbs up or share this content with your friends and also comment in the comment section down below. You can also find me online at www.blaze.net or on Twitter at The One Mule. And as always, thanks for watching.